The Bank of Canada has released its report card for Canadians. Despite what many analysts had predicted, the sluggish economy is not improving. And the jobless rate is at its highest level since April this year. And the public sector layoffs have hit a record high. According to the Bank of Canada, the country lost nearly 40,000 jobs in the month of July. Statistics Canada, the country's national statistics agency, reports the unemployment rate now stands at 7.2 percent. But economists say the numbers do not show the full picture. They don't know what the, 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 the fundamental body of employable people is because people get fed up and they leave the workforce. And, and so the, the proportion of people that are employed is taken in terms of the workforce. And uh, if, if, people aren't, if, if people have left the workforce, that goes down. And so it appears that the rate of unemployment is, is much smaller. Many economists expected better numbers this quarter. And many believe the economy is improving. Recent disasters like Quebec's train derailment and Alberta's flooding have been blamed for some of the numbers. Canada depends heavily on the U.S. economy, which has gone through some financial difficulties over the past few years. Although the U.S. economy looks to be back on track by adding more than 160,000 jobs in July, still many economists think Canada's road to recovery from the recession is a bumpy way ahead. Ashante Hathaway, Press TV, Montreal. Uh-oh, with news like that, you know that the Conservatives wish we didn't have the Internet. Well, you know, they still don't believe in statistics. <laughs> we lost 40,000 jobs. We're counting up the losses of jobs by the hundreds of thousands. But, hey, we're Video Radio. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Welcome to the show. We hope you keep smiling, keep your signs, and keep your attitude in the streets, and keep talking about stuff like this. Ottawa has decided to leave a UN group that tries to prevent droughts in Africa. The agency didn't know about the move until days after the decision was made. Amanda Pfeffer is following this story live from Ottawa. Why is the federal government quitting it? Well, Canada has been a, a signatory to this UN convention since 1994, and our legislature ratified it in 1995. And now we are the first of about 194 countries, all the countries uh, belonging to the UN, as well as the European Union, to opt out now of this agreement. And we understand that this happened quietly last week in Cabinet, and it was based on the recommendation of the Foreign Affairs Minister, John Baird. Amanda, what's the reaction then from people who actually do work in Africa? Basically that uh, we are spending literally millions of dollars dealing with uh, reacting to the fallout from uh, what they call desertification and this was a small amount of money used to uh, on research in order to figure out ways to prevent it and so it was good bang for our buck in terms of the long term because we spend all this money doing it and of course the opposition point out that this is the continuing uh, cooling off of our relationship with the United Nations and points to our opting out of Kyoto for instance as an example they say it was not a surprise to the UN they said they notified the secretary on Monday. Well, there's your problem. You're basing a decision based on something John Baird said. I can't base anything on anything John Baird says. The way he makes us look on the international stage is embarrassing. It's he, embarrassing. The whole carpet cabin is embarrassing. I know, but now you see that their media minister has left. He left like a... <laughs> the communications director. Yeah, I know. <laughs> He went to a cushy job in London. It's as if the politicians think we're not paying attention. Uh, we've got some really great stories coming up. We want you to stick around for that. Remember the municipal sustainability agreements coming up. But let's cover more of the Tory nightmare. What do you got? I got them revising history just a little bit. Yes, and uh, the racism problem amongst the conservatives is a complete saturation. And let's talk about it. You're tuned in to Radio Free Canada. Thanks for joining us. Uh, here's some information they wish we'd forget. The Canadian Museum of Human Rights is the birth child of deceased media mogul Israel Asper. It is due to open in 2014, but the museum's curators have already come under criticism. 
There is a perception that the museum will emphasize the suffering of certain ethnic groups over others, and this belief was confirmed this week when it emerged that the centuries-long attempts to destroy Canada's Aboriginal communities will not be referred to as genocide in the museum. The UN's legal definition of genocide includes forcibly transferring children with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. Legal experts observe that Canada's residential school system, which sees children from Aboriginal families and force them to study in Catholic and Anglican schools, is consistent with this definition of genocide. Critics accuse Zionist historians and curators of treating Jewish suffering as unique and more worthy of remembrance than the suffering of other groups. Hence, Jewish suffering gets referred to by such ethnic exceptionalists as a Holocaust with a capital H. Meanwhile, Aboriginal struggle to get their massive suffering recognized as a genocide. Ukrainian Canadians have also butted heads with the museum's curators. Many Ukrainian Canadians, like Aboriginal Canadians, feel their historic suffering is being underemphasized by the museum's curators for political and ideological reasons. Joshua Blakeney, Press TV, Calgary. Making the point that the Holocaust that occurred to the natives in Canada is not something the CBC, CTV, or Global will ever do. Or the Canadian I mean, Museum of Human Rights. And that's my opinion, of course. You know, this is a video blog, so, you know, that's just my opinion. But honestly, this is a Holocaust of epic historical proportions that they will never, ever owe up to. Yeah. And the victims are still wandering around. Now, me, myself, just to share... I'm status. I'm a status Indian, okay? I don't sound like it, and that's what everybody expects is they find it very odd. But I was swept up. I was told that my, you know, culture was not a good thing. Yeah, and I see a lot of that even amongst the youth that are downtown. Yeah, and it, you know what? I, oh, well, you know, dirty native savages, stuff like that. Um, that is still one of their main points. Oh, we do better than you do. You do Holocaust. Yeah. OK, I mean, you do genocide and I, you say, oh, well, that's OK, because it's us. I mean, Israelis pull that Holocaust card all the time. I know. We can get away with anything because we went through the Holocaust. Yeah. So, you know, so far be it for me to point out any facts or anything like that. Uh, but, but here. Anyway, sliding into recent history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now for something even more enraging <laughs> about our conservative government. Yes, the transparent, honest government. The RCMP is requesting records of three of Duffy's personal credit cards, transactions from one of his bank accounts, and information about his mortgages both in Ottawa and Cavendish PEI. Duffy says the PEI home is his primary residence. The RCMP doesn't buy it and says Duffy has demonstrated a pattern of filing fraudulent expense claims. The RCMP needs to dig deeper, in part because Duffy stopped cooperating with the auditors hired by the Senate when he used a $90,000 check from the Prime Minister's former Chief of Staff, Nigel Wright, to pay the expenses back. The investigation is further complicated because many of Duffy's claims aren't official receipts but are handwritten with many corrections and amendments and difficult for the RCMP's fraud investigator to understand at all. There are some expense claims where he, the investigator, is unable to determine how much was actually paid to Duffy as a result of the claim due to the pen strokes. The RCMP is also looking for all address changes associated with any of Duffy's accounts, given much of this investigation hinges on where Duffy actually spends his time. It notes Duffy's bank address was changed from an Ontario address to a Cavendish address on December 10, 2012. This date coincides with the timing of the December 6, 2012 Senate announcement of an internal audit pertaining to primary and secondary residency of all senators. The documents filed today also make clear the investigation into the deal between Wright and Duffy is ongoing, and the RCMP are wading through a pile of documents to make sense of that. Okay, so did you see Pamela Wallen in the front? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, nothing nefarious there. No. Nothing underhanded there. It's not like, you know, the senators that Harper puts into place are all corrupt or, you know, just... To, but that, that, well, that's just a coincidence. It is. You're a coincidence theorist. I... <laughs> I got to get a T-shirt that says that. Well, you know, it's lucky we had that. It's not as if somebody else is screwing up really bad, is it? Oh, well, you know, 
Wallen has been in the hot seat for the last six months as Deloitte auditors sifted through her travel expenses. Their confidential report went to two Senate committees today and CBC News has learned it's scathing. It details almost 400 questionable expense claims, totaling slightly more than $140,000. Most were travel expenses connected to Wallen's other jobs outside the Senate, like dinners in Toronto and in Guelph, where she was Chancellor of the University from 2007 to 2011. The audit shows Wallen attempted to retroactively change her claims, and three of her former assistants told auditors she fiddled the expenses. But Wallen says the audit retroactively applies new 2012 rules to trips she took years ago. Wallen is a former journalist who was appointed by Prime Minister Stephen Harper in 2009. He hotly defended her when the Senate expensive scandal first erupted. I've looked at the numbers. Her at travel costs are comparable to any parliamentarian traveling from that particular area of the country over that period of time. Wallen has since been kicked out of the Tory caucus and now sits as an independent. She's already paid back $38,000 to cover expense claims and promises to pay whatever else she owes with interest. But cutting a check may not be enough. I don't think that there's a mood in the Senate to be soft on anyone who has been found to have abused taxpayers' money. And it's not over yet. The full Senate committee will meet here again to decide what to do now that they've seen the audit. And they could refer the case to the RCMP, like they did with two other senators. How embarrassing. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah. The hits just keep on coming. <laughs> you know, uh, okay, so we mentioned it earlier, okay? We mentioned her name earlier. Do we got time for this? You oh, yeah, it? yeah, yeah. The audit came out. And, and, well, okay, you make up your own mind. What does the Conservative government have to fear from an audit into Senator Pamela Wallen's travel expenses? Quite a lot, actually. If Ms. Wallen is found to have improperly claimed expenses, the focus will once again shift to someone who the Prime Minister himself appointed and became, by all accounts, a party stalwart. Ms. Wallen, who has left the Tory caucus and now sits as an independent, has already repaid thousands of dollars. There may yet be more to pay back. Wallen has apologized and says mistakes were made, but that she was not attempting to bilk the system. Still, all this contrition may not be enough to prevent Canadians, and more importantly, Conservative supporters, from passing judgment. The government built its brand on fiscal discipline and cleaning up the ethical scandals that plagued previous Liberal governments. Now three words, Senate, spending, scandal, have threatened that brand. The only question that remains is how much damage has been done. For the Conservative government, the attempt in the coming weeks and months will be to make Senate reform, look Canada, we're cleaning up this rot, the big issue. Stephen Harper has said Canadians know he did not get into politics to defend the Senate and his party has been trying hard to make it more accountable. Whether Canadians believe him or care is the question. And they did. So I don't know whether the RCMP is going to have time to investigate, you know, actual crime <laughs> that's committed by people and not senators. Uh, it's really impressive to see that the RCMP has started to investigate white-collar crime. We talked to some of the legal experts around here, and they realized white-collar crime is not something the RCMP does. And now you can understand why the Prime Minister's office was so anxious to get a hold of controlling the RCMP. <laughs> That's just a coincidence, I, It is. It's just a coincidence that all of a sudden they weren't allowed to talk about what they were doing. Uh, so we've got more information and more stuff coming up right here at Radio Free Canada. Thanks for tuning in to the Conservative Nightmare. <laughs> and stay tuned for our Municipal Sustainability Project. That one is going out on the Internet right now, and we want you to get informed of how we are proposing to make change because they're proposing to maintain poverty. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Remember to check our sources because we do not make commercials that say, trust us, we're not like big news. We don't have to say that with a wink and a smile. And we want you to get involved too. Start up your own radio station, get your own newsletter, or just make a sign and get out in the street. The world is changing right now, and we're part of that change. What do we got coming up? We're going to be talking about people who are actually making the change. Okay, it's right here. Stay tuned. More to come.